So who knows what Monday was? So, last Sunday was the last day of Christmas, right? Uh, Christmas, December 25th, that's Christmas Day. But Christmas doesn't end until January 5th. And January 6th, the day after Christmas, is Epiphany. And today is Epiphany Sunday. Epiphany Sunday is always the Sunday after Epiphany. So if, if um, just for example, if Epiphany had fallen on a Saturday, then, you know, here we'd be. Uh, but it's always the Sunday after Epiphany. And what is Epiphany? Uh, you know what it means to have an Epiphany, right? Anybody ever had an Epiphany? It's like, a what moment? An aha moment, right? You, you ever have an aha moment? Now, I know when you saw that sermon title, some of you thought about a song, right, by the band Aha, a very popular song with um, Generation Z for some reason. Anyway, Epiphany is the celebration of the announcement of the gospel, the revelation of Jesus to Gentiles. It's the announcement of Jesus to the Gentiles. And the story most, um, most associated with Epiphany, of course, is the story of the Magi, the wise men. The three wise men, uh, they, they had a, a vision. They were to follow this star. They went to Herod. They told Herod that, hey, there's a king in, that's been born in Judea, and he's not just any king. This guy is going to be king of kings and lord of lords. And I don't know about you, but if you're already the king and you get news that a new king is coming, well, that's not good news for you, right? If you're the, if you're the honcho in some business and one day you get the news that somebody else is coming along that's then going to be the head honcho, well you might begin to worry about your security. And you might take steps or measures to mitigate that. Well, guess what? Around the time of Jesus' birth, King Herod got the news that he was, you know, not going to be king of kings very much longer in his, in his domain, his territory. So he was threatened by that and... He told the Magi, look, go find this king that's been born and let me know where he is so I can go and uh, pay him homage. Well, he'd pay him something, right? Like uh, the, 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 the wise men, you know, do you remember what the gifts were that they brought? They brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The King Herod wanted to bring him gold, frankincense, and myrrh, dir, right? Some scholars believe that the gold was not actual gold, but a valuable spice that was actually worth more than gold. Now, we, we have it in such abundance, it's not really that expensive. It's turmeric was the spice, they think, that um, because frankincense and myrrh are both spices, so it fits that, that uh, the other one would have been turmeric. And around that region, spices like that um, traded almost like currency. They were very valuable. All right, so let me, let me read you the story. Herod secretly calls, called for the wise men. He learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem saying, Go and search. And I'm in Matthew 2, by the way, if you didn't remember. And look for the child when you found him. Bring me word so that I may go and pay him homage. And when they had heard the king, they set out there ahead of them when the star that they had seen at his rising... Uh, they followed that until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. Well, they, they had been told in the vision, follow the star. The star will lead you to the Messiah, the promised one, this king. So when the star stopped, they got pretty excited. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And the star finally stopped. You remember being on long trips in the car? And you finally pull into the place where you're going. You know, if it's the dentist, maybe you're not excited. But if it's Disney World, gracious. That is, that's a feeling that um, we have a video 
uh, of, of our two girls. Uh, when we were going to uh, Washington, D.C. for those two years to help with the, the church there, we were dragging our children along and they were small and there were, there were a few occasions when it took us three and a half, four hours to get from Richmond to D.C. because of traffic. And they were, you know, we learned early on that we needed to pack food for them in case that happened. Um, but we took them to the zoo, the D.C. zoo, uh, while we were doing all that. And we didn't tell them. Yeah, we went to Congress. But uh, <laughs> we took them to the D.C. zoo. Uh, the four-legged um, crazy folk. But anyway, we took them to the D.C. Zoo, and uh, we didn't tell them where we were going until we actually got there. We pulled into the parking lot, and it was, a, it was one of the lower parking lots, and it's just surrounded by trees, and you don't really know where you are unless you're paying attention to the little brown and white signs that tell you you're at the zoo. And uh, Davina filmed them, filmed their little faces. I think Abby, was, she would have been... Two and a half or three, Faith would have been um, five. And the, the, the expression of joy on their faces when we stopped and they found out where we were. Can you imagine what these men were like when they arrived where they were supposed to be to meet the King of Kings? They were overcome with joy, overwhelmed with joy. When's the last time you were overwhelmed with joy? They were overwhelmed. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and they paid him homage. Then opening the treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. So listen to this. They were warned in a dream not to go back to Herod. Have you, ever, have you ever had a dream where you woke up in the morning and the dream was so real to you, so significant to you, maybe, maybe in the dream you were presented with options or decisions or maybe in the dream you were presented with clarity. Right? These, these wise men had a dream that they were not to go back and report to Herod. What if they had done what we so often do? When God speaks to us through a dream or a vision and we go, Hey, honey, I had the weirdest dream last night. And it was about this. What's for breakfast? What, what are we going to do today? And we, we leave it there. Now, I'm not saying that if the Magi had, had not listened to the dream, that Jesus would have been killed. God would have done it a different way. They listened to the dream, and it wasn't weird. It wasn't strange, and they weren't even Christians. Well, that, that upsets my apple cart a little bit. Does that upset your apple cart? God gave a vision to soothsayers? That's who these guys were. They were magi. They, they would read this like, like astrologers. You know, you ever, you ever read the horoscope? I think there should be two R's. Horoscope. That's who these guys were. They weren't believers. They weren't Christians. They were soothsayers. They were all the people we've been warned about in the Bible. Don't, don't hang around with those people. Don't, don't listen to those people. And don't, by the way. I'm not telling you to go get your palm read. I'm telling you that the God who is can strike a straight line with a crooked stick. And he, why? Why these wise men? Why these soothsayers? Why these astrologers? Why them? Was it because they were friends of Herod? Well, they didn't go back and report to Herod. I don't know why. But I know there's a significance in them not being from Israel. There's a significance in them not being a part of the line of David or from the seed of Abraham. 
There's a significance in the fact that they were not Jews, that they were Gentiles, because Jesus came for Jew and Gentile alike. And this is what we celebrate on Epiphany. So I'm not a Jew. Maybe you are. I'm not a Jew. Epiphany means a lot to me. Because I'm not a Jew. If I was Jewish, I would say, oh yeah, Epiphany, I'll come. You know, you ever, you ever, you ever hear that? Where I grew up, that was, y'all, y'all come sometime. Y'all come on over sometime. Y'all come. You ever hear that? Y'all come. And that's, y'all come is a standing invitation where I grew up. In our community, if somebody said, y'all come, that didn't, they didn't tell you a, a day and a time next Friday night from 7 to 9. If somebody said to you, y'all come, you know what that meant? You just show up whenever. And there were plenty of times when I was growing up, somebody would knock on the, if, if they knocked on the front door, daddy went and got the shotgun, literally, and he would, he would prop it behind the door. Because we lived kind of far out in the country on a, ma- on a main highway, and, you know, every once in a while something weird would happen. Two guys <clears throat> um, stopped one night late and wanted to use our telephone, and my dad wasn't going to let two strange men in his house with his family in the middle of the night at two in the morning. So they did donuts in the backyard and all over around the barn and tore up the grass, at, you know, I guess in retaliation. It was the first time I ever saw my dad fire a gun in anger. He went out the back door and fired some shots into the air or into the trees over their car and they got the hint and left. So, but if, if somebody knocked on the back door, well, that's, that's family or friends. We call that back door company. Your good friends, your close friends, they don't knock on your front door. Not, not at our house, knock on the front door and make me go in the good room. You know, we only had one good room in the house in that little 30 by 30 box we lived in. Don't make them open the front door. Come around to the back. That's where the, that's where the floor is good and worn and the color is off the vinyl, the linoleum floor because we walk on it so much. Sit down at the kitchen table. Y'all come. Jesus says to you, y'all come, all of you who are weary and heavy laden. Y'all come. You don't need an appointment. You don't need a day and a time, Sunday at 1030. Are you kidding me? Jesus says, y'all come. Who knows the name of the first Gentile that we have record of? First Gentile to become a Christian. Acts chapter 10, Cornelius. His conversion is so significant that Luke, in writing Acts, Luke records it three times in three separate places, in three separate contexts. He wants you to know about this man, Cornelius. Cornelius was a Roman centurion. Um, the, The structure of the military in Rome wasn't very much different than it is for our military, in fact, our, our U.S. Army uh, structure is, is somewhat similar in that, that you know, that there's, there's big groups and then within those big groups there's a smaller group and then within that group there's an even smaller group and it gets all the way down, especially like in the case of the Marine Corps, they have uh, squads, which I guess is 12, and then within that 12 there's four groups of three called fire teams. So it's all the way down, and there's leadership stacked all throughout. Well, the Roman centurion was um, basically, he would be like a company commander or a a sergeant major of a company of 100, maybe to 120 men. And the, the Roman centurion was referred to as the backbone of the Roman army. I have a friend who retired from the Marine Corps as a gunnery sergeant, And um, there's a saying they have in the Marine Corps, listen to Gunny, he'll keep you alive. Because he's got the most experience, the most real experience. And that's kind of who the Roman centurion was. They were were very well loved in most cases by their men because they lived with, ate with, and bled with their men. 
right? So they were close. Cornelius was a centurion, and he, he has this experience. In Acts chapter 10, verse 1, it says, In Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of, a, of the Italian cohort, as it was called. He was a devout man who feared God with all his household, and he gave generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. So this guy's not a Jew, okay? He, Cornelius is not a Jew, but he had, been, he had seen the failure of all of the Roman gods in the pantheon. He had seen the absolute ineptness of any of these gods to do anything positive to help anybody. So while he embraced the God of the Jews, um, he didn't embrace the law or um, circumcision. Those were the two things these, uh, these Gentiles who all throughout the New Testament you read about these Gentiles who were devout, God-fearing people. They embraced the God of the, uh, of, of the Jews, but not all of the customs and laws and you know, not the dietary laws or the Sabbath and all those things. So Cornelius is this God-fearing man, but one of the things that did change for him is in his meeting the God of the Jews, he became a very generous person. In fact, his generosity is featured in descriptions about his character. One afternoon about three o'clock he had a vision. Uh-oh. So, was he napping? Was it three o'clock? Well, three o'clock must have been a time when he took a nap, maybe a power nap. You know, 25, 30 minutes. You ever do that? You wake up and you're like, yeah. But if you mess up, you don't hear the alarm and you sleep for an hour. When you wake up, you're grumpy. If you sleep too long when you take a nap, it's worse than not getting a nap at all. And then you, you can't go to sleep at night, right? He had a vision at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Broad daylight. It wasn't a dream. It was a vision. That upsets our apple cart a little bit, doesn't it? Well, this is something that only happened back then, right? I mean, surely God's not giving people visions today, or is he? In the last days, saith the Lord, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your young men will dream dreams, and your old men will see visions. He stared at this person in the vision. It was an angel of God. He came to him and called him by name. Well, hello, if that won't get your attention. He stared at him in terror and he said, What is it, Lord? And he answered, Your prayers, your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa for a certain Simon called Peter is lodging with another Simon who is a tanner whose house is by the seaside. And when the angel spoke to him and had left, he called two of his slaves, a devout soldier from the ranks <clears throat> of those who served him. And after telling them everything, he sent them to Joppa. Here's a man who is in charge of a military force of about 100 to 120 men. He didn't just fall off a turnip truck. He's not an idiot. He's not easily shaken. Men that are in charge of combat troops like that can't be easily shaken. They can't duck at the first sign of trouble. Uh, Ray Lattice, who some of you know, um, had an opportunity to go to Afghanistan to the, to the uh, facility at the Jalalabad Air, uh, Air Base. And uh, he did some work there for the government for seven or eight months, and uh, he was telling me a story about a rocket attack where rockets are raining down on the facility and one of them hit close enough or mortars or whatever they were that it, 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 would, it sh would shake the building that he was in and ceiling tiles would fall out. He said he was on the floor in the hallway, scared to death, trying to get to a place where it was safe and he said this Marine walked out of his room in a pair of boxer shorts eating chips out of a bag and just laughed at him. Uh, the, the Roman centurion is the guy walking out in the hallway eating a bag of chips when everything is falling apart because he's not e easily shaken. He has this vision and it says immediately he got people together to follow through on the vision. Are we, are we that ready to hear God? Are we that quick to respond to God? 
I had a boss one time that was really hard to work for. And his thing was, when I say jump, you don't say how high. You just jump as hard as you can jump. Like when he said we, we were to do something, he wanted it done quick right now. About noon the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. Now, you, if you read the book of Acts especially, you see this all over the place, the way Luke writes this. It's like a Hollywood movie, cut scene. Cornelius' men are going to Joppa, and on, they're on their journey, and at some point during the journey, there's a cut scene, and Peter climbs up on the rooftop to pray. And you see these two things happening at one time because God is the great orchestrator. And he's orchestrating this meeting and he's preparing Peter for the meeting. And he went up on the roof and he got hungry. Well, that's, that's what God does. God takes the situation and uses it to teach us about himself. So he gets hungry and he fell into a trance while he was praying. Well... Gosh, that upsets your apple cart too, doesn't it? What do you mean he fell into a trance? It means he was praying and meditating and waiting on the Lord to such a degree he didn't lose control of himself. He gave control of himself completely to God. He fell into a trance. And he had a vision. God sent him a vision and there was a large sheet. Some of you know this story. Heaven opened up and something like a large sheet came down and... and it was being lowered to the ground by its four corners, and in it was every kind of four-legged creature and reptiles and birds of the air. And then he heard a voice that said, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. If you're hungry, get up and eat. Why was Peter hungry? Peter wasn't hungry for food. Peter is the person that Jesus said three times, Go feed my sheep. The hunger that, that Peter had was a hunger for sharing the gospel, and it, wasn't, it didn't have its origin in himself. His hunger for sharing the gospel came from Jesus. Feed my lambs. Well, Peter objected. And he said, by no means, Lord, I've never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. And the voice said to him again a second time, what God has made clean, you will not call profane. This happened three times. And the whole thing, the whole thing was suddenly taken up into heaven. So long story short, Peter goes out to meet these men and he says, I'm the guy you're looking for. Imagine being the guys that Cornelius sent, like go to Joppa. It's not like saying, go, all right, go next door to uh, Dr. Harold's office and talk to the lady inside. And then maybe the lady inside sees you come in and says, yeah, I'm the person you're looking for. Go to another city and the directions are, are specific, right? Like he's got ways and he puts in, uh, you know, uh, 75, uh, 21, um, Main Street, Joppa, you know, or Seaside Drive maybe because it was by the, the seashore. Sea, seaside Drive, Joppa. He, the instructions that he's given is like, all right, there's a guy named Simon called Peter and there's this other Simon. He's a tanner. He's got a house by the sea. So go to Joppa and meet up doesn't need specific instructions because Jesus is the divine orchestrator. Jesus knows he doesn't have to find the house because he's going to send Peter to meet him. And Peter just walks out and says, I'm the guy you're looking for. Imagine being those dudes. What the what? Are you kidding me? No. I had a vision. Yeah, well, our boss had one. And so they meet up. Cornelius wanted to know as he is known. He wanted to know God the way he is known by God. God knows us completely, intimately, and fully. And that was his desire, was to know God. And that's why he was generous. That's why he fell in love with humanity. Because see, God is love, and you're created in the image of God. And when you love, you meet your truest self. When you love, you not only meet your truest self, you meet the truest part of your being created in the image of God. When you love, you meet God. The more you love, the more you learn to know who God is. It's beautiful. 
When they met, Cornelius said, Four days ago at this very hour at three o'clock, I was praying in my house, and suddenly a man in dazzling clothes stood before me, and he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms have been remembered before God. Your alms, your generosity is a memorial before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who's called Peter, staying in the home of Simon the Tanner, over by the seashore. It says, So I sent for you immediately, and now you have been kind enough to come. So now all of us here in the presence of God are here in the presence of God to listen that all of the Lord, all that the Lord has commanded you to say. Epiphany. Reveal Jesus. Cornelius says, to me, a Gentile. Cornelius loved God, but he didn't know who God was. No one knows the Father except the Son. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. No one knows the Father except the Son. And those, I love the caveat that Jesus adds to the end of that, because that could be bad news for us. If Jesus had said, no one knows the Father except the Son, the end, everybody go home. Well, that wasn't very... I mean, is this supposed to be a pep talk, Lord? I mean, because I don't feel pepped. But he doesn't leave it there. He says, no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Father chooses to reveal Him. Jesus knows the Father. And He has chosen you to reveal Him. Not only has Jesus chosen you to reveal the Father to you, but He has chosen you to reveal the Father to others. To reveal Jesus to others. To share Jesus with other people, other Gentiles like me. And who knows what comes after Matthew eleven twenty seven? 27. Come to me, all of you, who are weary and heavy laden. And I will give you my rest. Y'all come. I've got a video. It's about five minutes long. And I do want to play it. And it's about an aha moment that a celebrity had. Uh, the guy's name is Bruce Johannesson. Uh, his stage name is C.C. C. DeVille. He was a lead guitar player for an 80s um, rock and roll band. And he just about ruined his life completely uh, with drugs and alcohol and uh, just terrible, terrible things. And I always believed that God was going to get him someday. And then he had an epiphany. So uh, let's go ahead and, and show that video and then we'll finish. Well, <clears throat> let's finish with a prayer. Father, thank you for the aha moment. The aha moments that led us in our journey so far. Thank you for the aha moments that brought us here together as a fellowship. Thank you for the aha moments, Lord, that perhaps pulled us out of self-hatred, self-centeredness. God, we thank you for the aha moments that make us generous. We thank you for the aha moments that give us a heart for others. We thank you for the aha moments that give us our eternal security. Holy Spirit, teach us how to believe the truth about ourselves. Lord, help us Believe what you believe about us. Help us believe what you believe about your Father and share it with the world. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.